We grew up interacting with the physical objects around us, and there are an enormous number of them that we, we every day use. Unlike our most computing devices, these objects are much more fun to use with. When you talk about objects, when another thing automatically comes attached to that thing, and that is gestures, how we manipulate these objects, how we use this object in everyday life. We use gestures not only to interact with these objects, but we also use to interact with each other. A gesture of namaste, maybe to respect someone, or maybe in India, I don't, don't need to teach a kid that this means four run in cricket. It comes as a part of our everyday learning. So I'm very interested from beginning that how, how can our knowledge about everyday objects and the gestures and how we use this object can be leveraged to our interaction with the digital world. Rather than using a keyboard and mouse, why can I not use the, my computer in the same way that I interact in the physical world? So I started this exploration around eight years back, and it literally started with a mouse on my desk. Rather than using that for computer, I actually opened it. And most of you might be aware that in those days, the mouse used to come with a ball inside, and there are two rollers that actually guides the computer that where the ball is moving and accordingly where the mouse is moving. So I was interested in these two rollers. And I actually wanted more, so I borrowed another uh, mouse from a friend, never written him, and I have now four rollers. What interestingly I did with these rollers is basically I took them off from these mouses and then put in a one line. It had some strings and pulleys and some spring. And what I got is basically a gesture interface device that actually acts as a motion sensing device made of out of $2. So here, whatever movement I do in my physical world is actually replicated inside the digital world just using this small device that I made around eight years back in 2000. Because I was interested in integrating these two worlds, I thought of sticky notes. I thought, why can I not connect the normal interface of physical sticky note to our digital world? A message written uh, on a sticky note with my mom uh, on a paper can come to my, an SMS, or maybe a meeting reminder automatically syncs with uh, my digital calendar. And uh, a to-do list uh, automatically syncs with you. But you can also search in the digital world, or maybe you can write a query saying, what is Dr. Smith's address? And this small system actually prints out, so it actually acts as a paper input-output system, just made out of paper. In one another exploration, I thought of making a pen that can draw in three dimensions. So I implemented this pen that can help designers and architects not only think in three dimensions, but they can actually draw so that it's more intuitive to use that way. Then I thought, uh, why not making a Google map, but physical world? Rather than typing a keyword to find something, I put my objects on top of that. If I put a boarding pass, it will show me where is your flight gate. A coffee cup uh, will show you where you can find more coffee, or where you can trace that cup. So this was some of the earlier explorations I did, because the, the goal was to connect these two worlds seamlessly. Among all these experiments, there was one thing very common. I was trying to bring a part of the physical world to the digital world. I was taking some part of the objects or anything intuitiveness of the real life and bringing them to the digital world. Because the goal was to make our computing interfaces more intuitive. But then I realized that we humans actually are not interested in computing. What we are interested in is in information. We want to know about things. We want to know about dynamic things going around. So I thought around about last year, uh, in the beginning of the last year, I started thinking that why can I not take this approach in reverse way? Maybe how about I take my digital world and paint the physical world with that digital information? Because pixels are actually right now confined in these rectangular devices that fits in our pocket. Why can I not remove this confine and take that to my everyday objects, everyday life, so that I don't need to learn the new language for interacting with those pixels? So in order to realize this dream, actually I thought of putting a big size project on my head. I think that's why it's called Head Mountain Projector, isn't it? 
I took it very literally and uh, took my bike helmet, put a little bit cut over there so that the project actually fits nicely. So now what I can do, I can augment the world around me with this digital information. But later, I realized that I actually wanted to interact with those digital pixels also. So I put a small camera over there that acts as a digital eye. Later, we moved to a much better or consumer-oriented uh, dependent version of that, that many of you are now knowing as Sixth Sense device. But the most interesting thing about this particular technology is that you can carry your digital world with you wherever you go with you. You can start using any surface, any wall around you as an interface. The camera is actually tracking all your gestures. Whatever you are doing with your hands, it's understanding that gesture. And actually, if you see, there are some color markers that in the beginning version we were using over there. You can start painting on any wall, that you stop by a wall and start painting on that wall. But we are not only tracking here one finger. We are giving you the freedom of using all the both of hands. So you actually can use both of your hands to zoom into or zoom out a map just by pinching operation over here. The camera is actually doing just getting all the images, it's doing the age recognition and also the color recognition, and like uh, so many small algorithms are going inside. So technically, it's a little bit so complex, but it gives you an output which is more intuitive to use in some sense. But I'm more excited that you can actually take it outside. Rather than getting your camera out of your pocket, you can just do the gesture of taking a photo, and it takes photo for you. Right? Thank you. And later, I can find a wall, any, anywhere a wall, and start browsing these photos. Or maybe, OK, I want to modify this photo a little bit and send it as an email to a friend. So, so we are looking for an, an era where computing will actually merge with the physical world. And of course, if you don't have any surface, you can start using your palm for simply operation. I'm here, I'm dialing a phone number just using my hand. Yep. The camera is actually not only understanding your hand movements, but interestingly, it's also able to understand what objects you are holding in your hand. What we are doing here is actually, for example, in this case, the book cover is matched with so many thousands of, or maybe millions of books online and checking out which book it is. Once it has that information, it finds out more reviews about that, or maybe uh, New York Times had a sound over you on that, so you can actually hear on a physical in book as a review Churchill of a sound. gave a famous talk at Harvard University. This was Thank Obama's uh, last visit uh, last week Thank to you, MIT. MIT. And in particular, I want to thank two outstanding uh, MIT So I was seeing the live Eric. of his talk outside uh, in just a newspaper. Your newspaper will show you live of your weather information rather than having updated like a, you have to check your computer in order to do that, right? When I'm going back, I can just use my boarding pass and to check, uh, oh, my flight has been how much delayed. Because at that particular time, I'm not feeling of opening my iPhone and checking out a particular icon. And I think this technology will not only change the way, <laughs> yes, it will change the way we interact with people also, not only the physical world. The fun part is like I'm going to Boston Metro and playing Pong game inside the train <laughs> on, on the ground, right? And I think the imagination is the only limit of what you can think of when this kind of technology merging with the real life. But many of you argue, actually, that all of our work is not only about physical objects. We actually do all lots of uh, accounting and paper editing and all this kind of thing. What about that? And many of you are actually excited about the next generation tablet computers to come out in the market. So rather than waiting for that, I actually made my own um, and just using a piece of paper. So what here I did is uh, remove the camera, the, all the cameras, webcam, have a microphone inside that camera. I removed that microphone from that. And that, just pinch that, like I just make a clip out of that microphone and clip that to a piece of paper, any paper that you found around. So now this, the sound of the touch is exactly getting me when exactly I'm touching the paper. But the camera is actually tracking where my fingers are moving. You can, of course, watch movies. Good afternoon. My name is Russell, and I am a wilderness explorer in Tribe 54. And you can, of course, play games. Uh, here, the camera is actually understanding how you're holding the paper and playing the car racing game. Yeah. 
many of you already must have thought, okay, you can browse. Yeah, of course you can browse uh, to any, any website. So you can do all sort of computing on a piece of paper wherever you need it. So, but more interestingly, I'm interested that how we can take that in a more dynamic way. When I come back to my desk, I can just pinch that information back to my desktop so that I can use my, my full-size computer. And why only computers? We can, we can just play with papers. Like paper world is interesting uh, to play with. So here I'm taking a part of a document and putting over here the second part of us from second place. And I'm actually modifying the information that I have over there. Yeah, and then I'm saying, okay, let's, this, is, this looks nice. Let me print it out, that thing. So I have a now printout of that thing. And now, so the, the workflow is more intuitive the way that we used to do before, maybe 20 years back, rather than now switching between these two worlds. So as a last thought, I think that integrating information to our everyday objects will not only help us to get rid of the digital divide, the gap between these two worlds, but will also help us in some way to stay human, to, to be more connected to our physical world. And it will actually help us not end up being machines sitting in front of another machines. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So Pranav, first of all, I mean, you're a genius. This is in incredible. <laughs> really. Thanks a lot. Um, what, what, are you, what are you doing with this? Is there, is there a company being planned? Or, how, or is this research forever or what? So there are lots of companies, actually, sponsored companies of Media Lab, are interested in taking this ahead in a one or the way. The companies like mobile phone operators want to take this in a different way than, than the NGOs in India are thinking that why can we only have sixth sense? We should have a fifth sense for missing sense people who cannot speak. Maybe this technology can be used for them to speak out uh, in a different way, but maybe speaker system. I mean, what are your own plans? Are you, are, My, you, are you staying at MIT or are you going to do I'm, something with I'm, it? I'm trying to make this more available to people so that anyone can develop their own Sixth Sense device because the hardware is actually not that, uh, that, uh, that uh, hard to manufacture or something, hard to make your own. own. And we will, I will provide all the open source software for them maybe starting next month. So that, open source? Wow. Yes. Wow. That's, are you going to come back to India with some of this yeah, at some yeah, point? Yes, of course. But, but, I mean, what are your plans, MIT, India? How are you going to split your, your time going forward? There is a lot of energy here, lots of learning. Like all of this work that you have ever seen is all about uh, I, my learning in India. And now, even if you see, it's more about the cost effectiveness. The system costs you $300 compared to the like $20,000 of surface tables or anything like that. Or maybe even the $2 mouse just a system at that time was costing around like $5,000. So we actually, uh, I showed that to, uh, in one of the conference uh, to President Abdul Kalam at that time. And then he said, okay, we should use this in Baba Atomic Research Center for some use of that. So I'm more excited about how I can bring the technology to masses uh, rather than just staying that technology into lab or environment, something like that. Based on, based on the people we've seen at TED, I, I would say you're truly one of the two or three most best inventors in the world right now. And Thank it's you. been an honor to have you here at TED. Thank you. Thank you nice so much. It was fantastic. If you did an internet search in the greater Detroit area, you'd see bad news. Companies were closing, that houses were being foreclosed upon. However, when there are negative things going on, there's also opportunity. And for people that look for it, like Dave, they see the opportunity and they say, I can make a difference here. There's a constant stream of, of negative news about you know, economics and whatever. And so it's nice to inject some positive news coming out of Ypsilanti. It's motivation to, to make you want to do something to help out your town. To my friend Corinne, who uh, is the manager at the Ypsilanti Food Co-op, sent me what she thought was a grant for a solar project. Turned out it was a very low interest loan. So it kind of sparked my interest, and then I did some searching and was able to actually find a small $6,000 grant from the state of Michigan. But I've never done solar. I didn't know square one about how it was done. We bought panels, we figured out how to do it, and that was our first system. We needed to monitor the power and be able to track how much is coming in and out. I did find products that would do this for us, but those products could cost thousands of dollars. 
you know, we didn't have a thousand dollars. We invented a way to read utility meters for essentially free. My goal is to see a cloud. And I wanted to see a nice, smooth solar graph, and then I wanted to dip a little bit and know that a cloud just went over the solar panels. My wildest dreams is to have 100 locations in Ypsilanti, all on Solar Ipsy, all being tracked in real time. And Ypsilanti would be the place to come for solar information. When I started, I was searching and, and I was looking in 10 or 12 different places. And so now we have a website where information's already been collated. And so somebody can search on solar, find this site, and hopefully have all the information they need. It's just amazing that you see people in far off remote villages in like Mongolia, you know, if they're looking for solar power or for some information, it's there for them to find. It's happened, you know, it's, it's so cool.